It was mid-afternoon on the 22nd of January, 41 AD. In the morning, the Emperor Caligula had been to the theatre, but he had a bit of a hangover, so he decided to skip lunch and freshen up with a quick bath. That's where he was going, all on his own, down a back alleyway in the palace compound, when he was jumped by a posse of soldiers. The first blow to his neck, or some said to his chin, didn't kill him. But the next 30 or so did. One nasty rumour said that the assassins ate his flesh. Caligula was just 28 years old. He'd been in power for less than four years. It was an extraordinary moment in Roman history. Only Rome's third emperor, it's Caligula, who has come to stand for the corruption, horror and excess of Imperial Rome. Psychopath and depraved, he is said to have ruled by the sword, to have made his horse into a consul, and to have insisted he be worshipped as a living god. And ever since, he has become a template for tyranny, with chilling echoes right up to our own age. One of Caligula's favourite sayings was, let them hate me, so long as they fear me. But how much of his story is true? On the throne for just four short years, Caligula has left us little physical evidence. And to get behind the myths means a detective hunt for clues all over the Roman world. From the battlegrounds of his war hero father in Germany, to the island of Capri, where people said he was schooled in the art of imperial power, to the astonishing luxury of his life as emperor. I'll uncover a Rome full of intrigue, murder and dynastic power and come face to face with not just the monster, but the man. So who was Caligula? And why has he gone down in history as one of Rome's biggest villains? site we have of Caligula in any historical record is a long way from Rome. From about the age of two, Caligula spent his childhood on the road on the empire's northern frontier, parceled round from army camp to army camp with his mum and his dad, one of Rome's most charismatic military commanders. By now, Rome had been under one-man rule for just 50 years, and a generation after the first Emperor Augustus, power was in the hands of one family, Caligula's. His father was Germanicus, the blue-eyed prince of the imperial family, the nephew of the Emperor Tiberius, and himself tipped for the throne. His mother was Agrippina, the granddaughter of the first Emperor Augustus, who was himself the adopted son of Julius Caesar. In the world of ancient Rome, you didn't get more blue-blooded than Caligula. He was born Gaius Caesar Germanicus, a name he inherited from his father, meaning something like Thrasher of the Germans. And these were the family fields of honour, the killing fields where Caligula's ancestors cemented their reputations and political power. Today, the Roman Museum in Xanten has been built not far from one of the legionary camps where Caligula spent time as a boy. Inside, there is a remarkable collection of Roman military gear, from medals of honour with portraits of Caligula's dad Germanicus and mum Agrippina dished out to soldiers, to what was then the most technologically advanced armour and weaponry on the planet. There are cavalry helmets and daggers, the remains of frighteningly powerful crossbows and rainstorms of piercing arrows, 
all of which remind us that Caligula's childhood playground was not some cosy peacekeeping mission, but a vicious war zone. But perhaps the museum's most intriguing artefact is also its most humble. This is a perfectly preserved Roman Caliga, a standard army issue soldier's sandal made of tough leather with hobnails on the sole. Now, if there's one object that's really associated with Caligula, it's the Caliga. The story goes that when he was a boy and he was living on military camps with his parents, his mum had him dressed up in the uniform of an ordinary Roman soldier, right down to the Caligai. He was a kind of baby squaddy, a legionary mascot. And we tend to think of the name Caligula as a rather grand imperial name. In fact, it was a little boy's nickname. It means little boots, bootykins, or the kid in the Caligai. When he grew up, Caligula hated it. It must have seemed as if he was being called Emperor Didums or something. And if you'd have asked him what his name was, he would have said quite correctly his name was the Emperor Gaius. The fact that even now we still call him Bootikins shows just how successful his enemies were in pouring scorn over him. He himself would have been horrified to think of us calling him Caligula. In the 1960s, in this small hilltop town in Umbria, a group of workers dug up an enormous bronze statue of Caligula's father, Germanicus, that once stood on what was probably an army parade ground on the edge of town. It shows him in the classic pose of an imperial leader, arm outstretched, addressing his troops. And standing beneath him, one can't help but sense the status and glamour of the man in whose shadow the little Caligula grew up. One theory is that the statue was put up by Caligula himself after becoming emperor, in memory of the event that radically changed the course of his life. For in 19 AD, when Caligula was just seven, Germanicus suddenly died on a mission to Syria, poisoned, he claimed, from his deathbed by the Roman governor Piso, even perhaps under the orders of his own uncle, the Emperor Tiberius. When the news of Germanicus' death reached Rome, there was an absolute explosion of grief. Life stopped, it said. Ordinary people wept in the street. They wrote up on the walls, give us back Germanicus. The only people not grieving were the emperor and his mother. They weren't seen in public and they didn't authorize a full state funeral when the ashes of Germanicus came home to be put in the family tomb. Eventually, Piso was put on trial, but a few days in, he conveniently committed suicide and the trial was turned into something more like a public inquiry. And this is a copy of the record of that public inquiry, the formal report inscribed in bronze, dated the 10th of December 20 AD. Basically, the message is the only person guilty here was Piso, conveniently dead. But the most extraordinary bit of the document, and its real point, is down here, where it says that one of these reports is to be inscribed in the chief city of every province, and that it is to be inscribed in Hibernis, in the winter quarters of each legion, cuiusque legionis. This is mass communication, Roman style. It's a major attempt to get the official message across everywhere. It's hard not to think it all might not have been too little, too late. The suspicions circling around Germanicus's death would mark the start of an increasingly bitter feud between Caligula's mother Agrippina and the palace.
convinced that Agrippina and her sons were plotting against him, Tiberius banished her to a remote island off the coast of Italy. And shortly afterwards, in 31 AD, he summoned the young Caligula, aged 19 or so, to the island of Capri in the Bay of Naples. This was the seat of Tiberius's power away from Rome. It was from here that he ruled the empire by proxy from a whole suite of imperial villas built high into the cliffs. Tucked away in a museum on the island is one small trace of Caligula's stay here. This may not look very much, just like a bit of old Roman brick stuck in a wall, but actually it's the only physical evidence that we have of Caligula's presence on Capri, because it's got his name stamped across it, Gaius Caesar. And that raises the question of what he was doing here and why Tiberius brought him, and there have been all kinds of theories. Was he here to be under surveillance? Was he here because Tiberius liked the kid? Or was he here to be groomed to be emperor and learn to start building like an emperor should? Away from prying eyes, it was here, Roman writers later surmised, that Tiberius schooled the young Caligula in the dark arts of tyranny and excess. And the stories they told of what Tiberius got up to here are all fantastical sex and violence. Those people he wanted to get rid of, he had chucked over the cliffs. And he'd stationed a platoon of sailors in boats at the bottom to finish them off with their oars if they weren't yet dead. And for poolside fun, he had a troop of little boys, his little fishes, he called them. They'd been specially trained to swim between his thighs while he was in the pool and nibble his genitals. Whatever Tiberius really got up to, we do know that Caligula's time and his charge was defined by remarkable brutality, much of which was aimed at his own family. For while Caligula was living in the lap of luxury, his mother Agrippina was beaten up. She lost her sight in one eye, she went on hunger strike, was force-fed, until finally she starved to death. Not only that, both his brothers came to violent ends. One by one, Caligula had lost his father and his mother and his two elder brothers. He and his sisters were the only ones in the family left. It's a chilling reminder that in Rome, the closer you were to power, the harder it was to survive. In the vaults of the British Museum is one macabre memento from Capri that sums up the young Caligula's life in the emperor's court. It looks like a real skull, but actually it's an extraordinarily lifelike work of art made of marble. This must have made a stunning centerpiece on the imperial dining table. Rich Romans loved the idea of eat, drink and be merry, because tomorrow you'll die. But if you put it back in the context of the imperial court, there are more sinister messages. For a start, there's the violence of the emperor himself. Anyone sitting round this at the imperial dining table must have been aware that their lives hung on a knife edge, that they could be flavour of the month one minute and dead the next. The best advice was never to let your feelings show. Keep poker faced. And there's a horrible story of an imperial princess who's dining one evening with her brother. He keels over, dead, probably poisoned. What does she do? What all good imperial princesses should do. She just goes on eating. In fact, we're told that when Caligula was on Capri and his relatives were being bumped off one by one, he learned never to show any emotion at all. Underlying all this nastiness was an issue that the Roman Empire always struggled to work out, the problem of succession. 
even though Roman power had now become a family business. Since the founder of the dynasty, Augustus, there was no fixed system for passing the power on. A fatal flaw that colours the whole Caligula story. Succession posed a problem for the Romans for two reasons. First, the emperor isn't a real job. It's supposed to be just a bundle of personal powers, and so you couldn't pass those on in a normal way. But the other problem is that Augustus and Livia didn't have children with each other, even though each of them had children with other people. And what that means is there isn't a clear line of succession, a son to follow a father, a grandson to follow a son. So when an emperor begins to seem a bit sick or unreliable or gets old, all sorts of groups begin to jockey for power. There's the legions in the provinces, there's the imperial bodyguards in Rome, you've got the courtiers, you have the ex-slaves in the palace who want to know who's going to own them next, and then you've got various imperial women trying to get their sons into power. And so it's a, it's a very, very unstable situation. It is that instability and the, the uncertainty of it all that, that both produces real violence and, and also allegations and rumours of violence. That's right. First thing that Tiberius does when he succeeds Augustus is he sends a boat to an island on which one of his relatives has been kept in exile for decades to have the boy killed because he could have been an alternative. And what does Caligula do when he takes power? One of the first things he does is he has his cousin, a little boy named Tiberius Gemellus, murdered because he's somebody else who could have been emperor. And what's amazing is that for the first hundred years of the empire, there's, there's not a single emperor about whose death there isn't some kind of allegation that he was bumped off, you know, that the poison mushrooms had done him in. And there is that, that story of Caligula, who some people said had actually smothered Tiberius, uh, you know, when he was, you know, asleep in order to take power himself. And the other story is he got the captain of the Praetorian Guard to do it for him, because emperors have people who do the smothering for them. However Tiberius really died, two days after his death, on March the 18th, 37 AD, the Senate declared Caligula Rome's third emperor. He could now triumphantly return to Rome as the ruler of the known world. He was just 24 years old. At the time, he must have seemed the best choice. As the childhood mascot of the troops and the son of the great Germanicus, he had the support of the army. And as the great-grandson of Augustus, he could claim a direct bloodline back to the founder of the dynasty. And to the adoration of the crowds, one of Caligula's first acts as emperor was to make a huge play of these family connections. Braving the stormy seas, he made a great song and dance of bringing the ashes of his dead mother back to Rome, burying her with his own hands here in the enormous family tomb built by his great-grandfather, the mausoleum of Augustus. At the Capitoline Museums in Rome, the whacking tombstone Caligula put up to his mother still survives. And it's so much more than just a grave marker. It starts by saying, Ossa, these are the bones, in fact, the ashes of Agrippina, the daughter of Marcus Agrippa, the granddaughter, Neptis, Dewey Aug, of Augustus, the first emperor, who's now a god, a Dewis. And she's the wife, the uxor of Germanicus Caesar, the golden boy of the empire. And she's the mother, Mertris, of Gaius, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus, Brinkeps, the emperor, Caligula. In a way, it says just as much about Caligula. This is his manifesto to his right to imperial rule. But there was another way in which Caligula could get the message across about who was now in charge. By the money he minted, stamped with his portrait, and which he showered down on the people of Rome. Caligula is supposed to have been absolutely, spectacularly generous. He, he's said on some occasions to have gone up to the first floor of a building in the Forum and actually thrown money, thrown coins at the crowd. They 
would have got some good cash to take home. But more important, in a way, you'd also go home with uh, a message. Because one of the ways that emperors could get their version of events and their slogans across to the Roman people at large was to put them on the coins. So you, know, you literally carried around the imperial propaganda in your pocket. In Caligula's case, they hammer home the point about the royal blood flowing through his veins. This one shows Caligula on one side, his father, the great Germanicus, on the other. Another shows a carriage parading a statue of his mother in celebrations founded in her honour. And even more important, this one shows Caligula sacrificing a bull at the temple of his great-grandfather, the god Augustus. But this one has an even more pointed message. On the one side, there's a really gorgeous portrait of Caligula and his name here, Gaius Caesar. But on the other, you can see what must be him standing on a box, his arm outstretched, and he's talking to a group of soldiers. And it says at the top, ad locut, short for ad locutio, the speech of the emperor to his troops. Uh, and underneath, C-O-H, short for cohortes, the cohorts of the Praetorian Guard. And the message of this is clear. Whatever family background you have, whatever deals you've done, nobody in Rome can become an emperor unless they've got the support of the army. And this is what many modern despots and tyrants have also discovered. Without the support of the troops, you're either deposed or you're dead. These coins give us an idea of how an emperor branded his image in the days before TV and radio. Alongside stamping his face on the cash, cheap cameos of Caligula were cut from glass and clay, and portrait busts were sent out across the empire to be copied and turned into a whole gallery of imperial statues. And if you've ever wondered why there are so many heads and so few bodies, one reason is that the heads were always meant to be replaceable. You can see just how easy it would be to take one head out and pop another one in. Once established on the throne, one of the ways Rome's new emperors cemented their power was to build. And even if Caligula ruled for just four years, we know that some of Rome's most iconic ancient monuments started life under his watch. There were the aqueducts, the Aqua Claudia and the Anio Novus, bringing water from over 40 miles away to the centre of Rome. The obelisk that now stands in front of St Peter's is also Caligulan, shipped over from Egypt on an enormous specially built boat. And then there was the most obvious statement of Caligula's power, the imperial HQ on the Palatine Hill, whose Latin name, Palatium, gives us our own word, palace. Most of what we now see here dates from long after Caligula's death. His own building was destroyed in the Great Fire of Rome in 64 AD, but it seems that Caligula was the first emperor to remodel the imperial residences to make them more palatial, in our terms. The emperor didn't just live on the Palatine Hill. Caligula also inherited vast pleasure gardens called Haughty on the outskirts of the city. One of them, the Haughty Lamiani, is still a garden of sorts in modern Rome, and it's the location of the only eyewitness account of Caligula in action that we have. It was written by Philo, a Jew from Alexandria, who had come to petition the emperor against political discrimination back home. And it's a rare glimpse of Caligula the emperor face to face with his subjects. When Philo and his delegation get to their appointment, they discover that the emperor's mind is actually on home improvements. And they traipse around after him through the gardens as he goes from pavilion to pavilion, planning his makeover. When they get his attention, they bow down to the ground. But it doesn't cut much ice with Caligula, who simply says, 
So you're the god haters who don't think I'm a god then? And he follows that up by asking an anyway. Why don't you eat pork? One of the Jews thinks quickly on his feet and said, well, you know, quite a lot of people don't eat a lot of things. I mean, some people don't eat lamb. I'm not surprised, said Caligula. It tastes horrible. And the flunkies all laugh. It's a wonderful and horrible vignette of the day-to-day -day exercise of imperial power. There's no cruelty here, there's no violence, there's even a bit of banter. But all the same, it's humiliating. Caligula's message is quite clear. My fancy window glass is more important than the Jews of Alexandria. It's a revealing story. And it also tells us a lot more than we might think about imperial luxury. For one of the ways emperors dazzled you with their power, rammed it in your face, was with the very trappings of their world. And it's from the pleasure gardens that we can still find traces of Caligulan splendor. From them have come some of the most impressive and famous statues of ancient Rome, such as the Discobolos, the discus thrower, a version of an earlier Greek masterpiece. There's the Maid of Anzio, found at the palace where we think Caligula was born. And the sleeping hermaphrodite, a wonderfully urbane joke, the kind the palace just loved. On the one side, She's a luscious sleeping woman. On the other, she's definitely more of a bloke. And in the 1870s, excavators dug up an astonishing find in one of the imperial pleasure gardens that used to be Caligula's. Hundreds of precious stones, rubies, garnets, carnelians, bits of rock crystal and amber embedded in amazing frames of filigree silver and gold. When this stuff was first discovered in the 1870s, no one could quite work out what it was. One idea was that they'd come across a throne room. But there's just so much of this stuff that I think we have to imagine precious stones literally embedded in the palace walls, you know, twinkling in the lights at night, looking amazing, or perhaps a bit tacky during the day. We do know that Caligula was dead keen on pearls. And one contemporary witness says he actually used to like slippers with pearls sewn into them, which, if you ask me, is a far cry from those little military boots he started out with. It's a cute vision. A newly crowned emperor showing off his pearled slippers to his flunkies. But it's also another example of how the imperial family used the ostentation of their world to unsettle and disarm. This is one of the most iconic and impressive imperial paintings from ancient Rome, the so-called Garden Room, designed for Caligula's great-grandmother Livia, in whose home Caligula spent time as a boy. It's an impossibly utopian scene. The trees are all full of perfectly ripe fruit. Every flower is perfectly in bloom. And in the gloom of the flickering lamps 2,000 years ago, it'd be hard to know whether we were looking at a real garden or a painting of one. And of course, that sort of illusionism is one of the most impressive trademarks of Roman art. But it's also slightly unsettling. The blurring of the boundary between the fake and the real is one of the factors about Roman court culture that made it so scary. You never quite know whether what you're looking at is real or an imitation, pretense or reality. On the one hand, what you think is real turns out not to be. And there's a great story about going to dinner with Caligula Looking at the fantastic spread, it all looks wonderful until you spot that the food on the table is made of gold. It's very precious, but what are you supposed to do? Can you pretend to eat it? And on the other hand, what you think is fake can turn out to be deadly real. 
It's another story of Caligula having what looked like a practice gladiatorial bout with an opponent with wooden swords. Except that Caligula had a real weapon. So this all looks very impressive. It's all very lovely, but it reminds us that there's a more shadowy, sinister world of smoke and mirrors in the Imperial Court. It's a perfect example of the choreography of threat that lurked beneath everyday palace life. A threat, if we think about it from the Emperor's point of view, that worked both ways. The labyrinthine corridors of the palace were teeming with people, visiting dignitaries and spies to the collectors of the Imperial rubbish. It must have been a security nightmare. How did the Emperor ever know who was who? And how did he marshal his own security? They did have a system of passwords. The Emperor would issue a new one each day and you'd have to say the word if you were challenged. But that wasn't enough for the most anxious Emperors. One of them is said to have had the walls of the palace lined with mirrors. So he really could see who was coming up behind him. In this world, where the Emperor was always watching his back, the people he ended up trusting the most weren't just his personal security force, but also his slaves. And high up on a wall of a museum in Rome is the record of the staff from one of Caligula's actual palaces. Each one tells us what they did. Here's one, for example, Saturninus Sphire. That's short for Sphirista. Spirista means ball player, but perhaps Saturninus was a personal trainer. Uh, we've got Argeus. He's a gubernator, the helmsman, perhaps, on the imperial yacht. But perhaps my favourite of all is this chap here, Venustus Speck. Now, spec could be short for speculator, so Venustus might have been a watchman or spy. But it could also be short for specularius, in which case he was the guy who made the mirrors. It's a wonderful snapshot of the underbelly of court life. But it would be a mistake to think that they were just lowly servants. Some of them played a vital role in the palace's strategy of control and fear. Aphetus here, he's an invitator. He's the guy who controls the guest list at the palace dinner parties. Now, Roman aristocrats wouldn't have touched this kind of job with a barge pole. But these guys could have quite a lot of power. And Romans told quite a lot of sometimes wild stories about just how powerful these imperial slaves and ex-slaves were. Caligula's supposed to have had one called Protogenes, um, who carried around with him under each arm, with more than a bit of menace and a bit of ham acting at the same time, two different files, one labelled dagger, the other labelled sword, as if they contained the lists inside of who was to be put to death and how. It's not hard to see why the emperor relied on these guys. They didn't represent a direct threat to him. They weren't going to become emperor themselves. And after all, he owned most of them. But in the end, didn't actually do Caligula any good. Some of them are supposed to have been involved in the final plot to kill him. This is now one of the most powerful images of Caligula that we have. A man who is paranoid about his own security, and not unreasonably. As he no doubt learnt from the fate of his own family under Tiberius, conspiracies were an absolutely inevitable part of imperial life. If Caligula's always looking behind him, if he's always watchful, are there people who really are out to get him? Yes, there were people out to get him, and I think there were of two quite different types. Either there are people within the extended family who accept that Rome is now a dynastic autocracy, of which they are part, but want themselves, rather than Caligula, to be the autocrat. But there's also another type of potential opposition, which is people who don't think that Rome ought to be a dynastic autocracy at all, and they want to put the clock back 
to the Republic uh, run by the Roman aristocracy, run by the Senate. But it's really the, the first type. It's the, the family trying to replace him from one of their own number that looks like it's the most important, or most, we have most evidence for. Uh, yes, his brother-in-law, um, Emilius Lepidus, uh, was executed for plotting against him, and his wife, Caligula's sister, and also Caligula's other surviving sister, were both exiled as a result. So clearly Caligula saw this as a threat from those closest to him inside the family to his own position. So in a sense he's quite right to be looking over his shoulder because the people who got the knife out are likely to be the people he's hanging out with most days of the week. Yeah, and he doesn't know how many of them there are. Ever since, historians have wanted to make this family plot one of the turning points in Caligula's reign that marked his transition from golden boy with promise to the maniacal monster we've all come to know. But the fact is that this is the period of Caligula's life, his time in power, about which we actually know the least. Were these conspiracies real conspiracies? Was this the moment that he started to lose his grip? We don't know. What we do is that this is when the stories of madness and excess that have come to define Caligula mostly start. And perhaps the most famous is that he gave his favourite horse, Incitatus, that's Speedy, his own palace, that he fed him oats mixed with gold and that he made him a consul of Rome. The fact is that no ancient writer ever says that Caligula made his horse a consul. What they say is that he planned to, or that people said he planned to. I'd be pretty certain that what underlies all this is a bit of banter, a Caligulan joke. I mean, I can imagine him at dinner one evening with his friends among the aristocracy and he's trying to needle them a bit. And he's saying, oh, you're a hopeless lot. I'd rather have my horse consul than one of you. And that then goes down in history as if it was serious. But anyway, we all do love stories about monarchs and their pampered pets. Just think of our fantasies about Queen Elizabeth and her corgis, how they have diamond collars and they eat out of silver bowls and they're served by footmen in uniform. I wonder what we'd say if we found that she nicknamed one of them Prime Minister. And it wasn't just stories of unbridled excess. Much of what else was thought wrong with Caligula came down to his sex life. It was said he turned his palace into a brothel, loved dressing up in women's clothes, and was so insatiable for sex, he wore out his male partners. For us, Caligula has become more than anything a byword for sexual excess and perversion. We can hardly hear his name without conjuring up images of drunken orgies, sex in the wrong place, with the wrong people, with little boys, married women, virgins, and most notoriously, with his own three sisters. If we were making a porn movie, Roman style, we'd be bound to cast Caligula in the lead. And if these stories have been added to and embellished over the years, they actually first appear in sources written years after his death, mostly by the second century biographer Suetonius. And they tell us just as much about the anxieties of the Roman elite as they do about Caligula. So you get these tales about, you go to dinner with Caligula, you know, a senator, and you take your wife, and then in the middle between courses, you suddenly discover that the emperor has gone out of the room with your wife, uh, and they come back a bit later, they all look a bit flushed, uh, and then the emperor says, oh, she's not very good in bed, is she? Yeah, and, and I think uh, associated with those stories, there's, there's the account of how um, people come into the banquet, Caligula's, you know, on his couch, people file past the end, and he acts like someone at a slave market, you know, sort of checking out the girls, trying to decide which one he's going to select for later. So this, this is how the emperor shows his power, is by um, humiliating the elite in all sorts of different ways, and this is one way amongst many. But perhaps the most damning story was Caligula's incest with his favourite sister Drusilla, with whom, as a boy, he was said to have been discovered in bed by his own grandmother. There's no actual accusation of 
incest by anybody contemporary, aptly contemporary with Caligula, is there? And even these, um, this Suetonius stuff where he's talking about granny finding them in bed, I mean, it's quite interesting that even Suetonius is only saying, people used to say that. Yeah. Mm. You know, the gossip was, whereas he's quite clear that incest took place. When it gets to the detail, it's all yeah, kept at a well, distance. Yeah. Mm. Yes, and I mean, I think even Seneca, who's pretty much Caligula's contemporary, he does talk about when, when Caligula's sister Drusilla dies, Caligula's excessive grief for Drusilla, that she, he kind of doesn't know what to do with himself. He dashes off to the country, he dashes back to Rome, he tries to, to console himself with gambling, and you know, he, he goes around in a terrible state. But he doesn't link that to perverse sexuality. I mean, I think there's also the sort of dynastic aspect of it. I mean, the stories about incest are partly about their anxieties about the, the way that power's now transmitted in the Roman world, that instead of it's, you know, going from one lot of middle-aged men to another lot of middle-aged men, you know, through a proper process in the Senate, it's, um, you know, it's one family that's holding on to power, and the women in that family then have you know, influence in a way they never had previously done under the Roman Republic. So really what these stories are telling us, are telling us about power? I think that's right. There, he is a youngish man. Um, he's not a great military leader or anything like that. But he's got all this power as leader of the Roman world, and uh, his relations with the Senate are clearly very uneasy. So that they tell all these these stories about his outrageous behaviour. Perhaps this is a clue to one of the problems of Caligula, whereas Augustus and Tiberius had come to power after prominent military careers. Botikins was thrust on the throne at just 24. Without the military pedigree or political experience to earn the elite's respect, it's hardly surprising he might cast around for alternative, more king-like models of leadership. And that included presenting himself as both emperor and god. The boundary between Roman emperors and the gods was always a fragile one. But Caligula trampled right through it. He's said to have insisted on being worshipped as a god in his own lifetime. And to make matters worse, we're told he transformed the most symbolic space in Rome, the People's Forum, into his own stage to be worshipped. One story was that he turned the Temple of Castor and Pollux into the porch of his own house and used to go and sit there between the statues of the gods, waiting to be worshipped. Another story was he used to go up to the Capitoline Hill to talk to Jupiter there, and then built a between the Palatine and the Capitoline to make those conversations a bit easier. It's even said that he had flamingos sacrificed to him. If there's now nothing left of these buildings above ground in the Forum, Archaeologist Henry Hurst has uncovered evidence beneath that suggests they might not be entirely fantasy. We dug over all of this area and were very lucky in that we found some unusually well-dated remains and we could date them pretty much to around 40 AD, around the time of Caligula's reign. And what they consisted of was a large courtyard going that way towards the hill and behind it a very grand room and a grand courtyard and then where we are, a big enclosure with a, a central monument. And the combination of that and this grand courtyard and room makes one think of some sort of a palatial complex. And on the other side of that wall is the Temple of Castor and Pollux. Yes. So the story that Caligula extended the palace out towards the Forum and made the temple his vestibule seems quite possible because these remains are huge and palatial and very close to the back of the temple. And what about Caligula's fantastical bridge to Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill? Which, if true, would have spanned a distance of over 250 metres and been 30 metres above the ground. The sane and traditional view of this is that the bridge was just a timber footbridge which went from somewhere high up using the roofs of buildings and ended up over in the Capitoline, so you wouldn't find any traces archaeologically. But we have the mystery of what we're standing on. What it looks really like is a pier of the, of the Roman bridge at Verona. These looked like that quite a bit, so we thought, is this a bridge pier? 
And in favour of that is this question of levels, because the temple behind us there is one story up from where we are. There's also the story about how Caligula threw coins from the roof of the Basilica Julia, also one story up, and that was just over there. So it would be quite sensible, if you were having a bridge, for it to be effectively one story high, so that it could link these things all at first floor level. So raised walkway, and then up to the Capitoline. And then eventually up to the Capitoline, yes. It's just a small block of marble, a tantalising clue to the lengths Caligula went for his own self-aggrandisement. But it also points to the difficulty we now have in separating fact from fiction. After just four years in power, there's little hard archaeology that we can tie to Caligula for certain. But there is one site not far from Rome where we can. This is Lake Nemi, one of Caligula's favourite places. And it's where all the myths come together. The uncontrolled extravagance, the divinity and even the violence. It was known in the ancient world as the Speculum Dianae, the Mirror of Diana. And in the 1930s, it was the site of one of the most stunning finds in Roman archaeology. Two enormous floating villas that were so large and so lavish that they've become the ultimate symbols of Caligula's excess towards the end of his reign. And unsurprisingly, it was Italy's 20th century tyrant, Mussolini, who spent a fortune raising them from the mud and installing them in a huge museum at the end of the lake. The shells of the boats were tragically destroyed in the Second World War. Now we've only got models, but much of the hardware still survives. No doubt whose boats these are. It says Gaius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. These are Caligula's barges. It's a bit hard to know what a water pipe's doing on a boat. They can't be ordinary boats. Perhaps they're um, bringing the water to Caligula's hot tub under the stars. Suetonius has left us a vivid description of other Caligulan boats. So luxurious, they had jeweled prows, sails of purple silk, and bathrooms of alabaster and bronze. Long thought a myth, the boats of Naomi hint they might in fact be true. For alongside the naval hardware of the ships are glimpses of astonishing imperial luxury. There are rows of columns made from Grecian marble, sinister sculptures of Medusa heads and huge golden hands, beautifully sculpted mooring rings of wolves and lions and balustrades cast in solid bronze. There have been all kinds of theories about what these boats were actually for. Some people have thought they must have been religious. Was it here that Caligula came to commune with the goddess Diana by the light of the moon? Or was one of them a temple to the Egyptian goddess Isis? Or were they just very lavish pleasure barges? Romans with too much money loved nothing more than to build out onto water. Was that what Caligula was up to? The boats of Nemi will no doubt always remain an enigma. But there is one place on the lake where Caligula's intentions come into sharper focus. All around the shore were dozens of shrines and temples that went back hundreds of years. And one of them raises troubling questions about whether he was a victim or actually a colluder in his own fate. This was once the Sanctuary of Diana, a richly decorated temple in a grove of sacred trees. There was just one weird thing about the Sanctuary of Diana, and that was the priest in charge, the so-called King of Nemi, the Rex Nemorensis. First of all, he was a runaway slave. And secondly, in order to get the job, he had to kill the present incumbent. If he wanted to become Rex here, 
You came to the sanctuary, you went and found the special sacred tree, you pulled off a branch. If you managed to pull off that branch, you were allowed to challenge the current priest to a fight to the death. If you won, you became Rex yourself, but of course, you also got a death sentence because someone else would be along sooner or later to challenge you. Ancient writers tell us about seeing the priest in this sanctuary. He had a sword in his hand and he was always looking furtively about him for obvious reasons. The ritual of Naomi harked back to a very primitive level of ancient religion. And Caligula was said to have revived it with glee, finding a slave to come and kill the priest in charge. Whether Caligula did that because he wanted to inject a bit of religious reality into what had become a charade, or whether it was just capricious sadism, we don't know. But it's hard not to think of the king of Naomi as an uncanny double of the emperor of Rome. Both were looking behind their backs. Maybe Caligula had spotted that too. However knowing Caligula might have been, in the end, it didn't save him. On the 22nd of January, 41 AD, he was assassinated after just three years, 10 months, and eight days in power. And if the facts of Caligula's life might forever elude us, ironically, it's his death about which we know the most, thanks to a graphic account written by a Jewish historian, Flavius Josephus. Peter Wiseman is taking me to where he thinks is the exact spot where Caligula, the Emperor Gaius, was set upon by members of his own personal security force. He sees coming towards him a colonel of the Praetorian Guard called Cassius Chiria, so whom safe. he knows of old, whom he thinks he's safe. Cassius Chiria, however, is the leader of the assassination conspiracy. And Chiria draws his sword and he brings it down as hard as he can. Gaius is staggering around, totally disoriented, and the guy who actually gave him the final blow was a man called Aquila. So he is the man who has the credit for the assassination of the Emperor Gaius, Caligula. Are people pleased a tyrant's some, some dead? People thought, some people thought that. What you have to understand uh, about Gaius Caligula is that he was enormously popular with the ordinary population. He was a Caesar. He was the son of Germanicus. He was the great-grandson of, of Augustus. He was the great-great-grandson of Julius Caesar. All these were popular heroes. Yeah. He was their popular hero. And mm. they hated the idea that people, senators, senior army officers, should take it upon them to kill their man. But there's a sort of irony to this, isn't it? Because this is not an uprising of popular will. This is a take-out move by the Praetorian Guard. Yes, a small group of senior officers who are also uh, involving uh, senior senators. It's a question what they expected to happen afterwards. It seems that Kyria and the others were idealistic enough to believe that in killing Gaius, they would put an end to what we call the Principate. There wouldn't be an emperor anymore. But in the end, they get this you know, very, very brief little flowering of what looks as if it might be about to become uh, the overthrow of autocracy entirely and the return to the Republic, a little bit of debate. And then you know, half an hour later, they find Caligula's uncle, Claudius, to put back on the throne. That's because the Praetorian Guard itself depended on there being an emperor. It was the ultimate betrayal and a chilling reminder that in Imperial Rome, it was not the emperor, but the army who held the reins of power. But there's one final chapter in Caligula's story which adds, I think, to his terrible reputation. There's evidence that attacks on his memory began almost before his body went cold. To justify his assassination, the new regime condemned him as a tyrant. His uncompleted building projects were then taken over and inscribed with Claudius's name. 
Some of his coins were defaced, his initials symbolically scratched out, and in many of his official statues, the heads were either replaced or destroyed. And at the wonderful Monte Martini Museum in Rome is a strange bust of Caligula's uncle, the new and in many ways just as vicious emperor, which underscores the shifty awkwardness of the transition of power. The face looks for all the world like the Emperor Claudius. It's a bit middle-aged and frowny, just how Claudius is often shown. But he's got this strangely bouffant fringe. And if you go up above him, you can see that whole bouffant hairstyle has been roughly chiselled off. What's gone on is that a statue of Caligula has been changed into a statue of Claudius. And it looks pretty weird, except if you imagine that this head would have been on a full-length statue. And if you get low down, well, actually, he works pretty OK as Claudius from this angle. Now, it's a way of saying Caligula is obliterated and Claudius is now on the throne. I'm sneaking suspicion that he also says, actually, the new emperor is only the old emperor with a recut face. This hybrid head gives us a clue as to why it has always been hard to come face to face with the real Caligula. In the bloody transition of power, his real face has got lost. And to find him, you now have to look for him in other ways in the shadow of his heroic father on the battlegrounds of Germany, in the bricks of the palace on Capri, where, one by one, he lost his family, or in the eerie luxury of his boats found at the bottom of Lake Nemi. And if what this tells us is that some of the myths may be true, the paranoia, the excess, even the self-proclaimed divinity, the rest we'll never know. Were the stories of murder and madness created as much by Caligula himself to further a culture of fear? Or were they spun, just like his nickname Bootikins, to blacken his name and to justify his violent assassination? Whatever the truth, it's in the story of Caligula that all the elements of tyranny as we now recognise it come together for the first time. And perhaps that's why he's left such a powerful imprint on our world. For almost 2,000 years now, Caligula's made people reflect on power and its abuse. The man and the myth, and to be honest, you can't ever quite separate the two, have raised all kinds of questions about cruelty, excess, about adoration, about the delusions of an autocrat, and about his fearful isolation. But for me, Caligula also turns the spotlight onto ourselves, about what our own responses to tyranny should be. Maybe there's a lesson. After all, when that group of disgruntled army officers decided to rid Rome of the monster, sure, they left him in bits on the palace floor, but all they got was more of the same.